So we are the co-founders of something called the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative, which is deliberately a mouthful. Um, and we're a group of philanthropists that fund uh, psychedelic clinical trials and psychedelic science. So we have the... All of you, all of you. Uh, Gra Graham has also been instrumental in working on cannabis legalization for a very long time. So if you live in a state where cannabis is legal medically or recreationally, he probably had something to do with it. Um, so it's, it's just like a real privilege to be here. And um, we have a whole day of amazing talks here. This is our first day through Saturday. One thing we'd love you to do is, I mean, clearly we did not have too much trouble getting the word out. I was gonna say grab flyers and bring them to your camps, but maybe don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But I was told to say that, so, you know, do. Um, and we've got this going through Saturday. Um, we've got a real all-star lineup today uh, going through 5 o'clock when these two yahoos will give a talk. So you can hear about psychedelic philanthropy if you stay till the end. So that's when everybody leaves, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, we've got, we're going to start with Rick Doblin and living legend John Gilmore. Um, we're then going to have uh, Sarah and Ryan are going to talk about the Zendo Project. Uh, Mitch Gomez, who runs Dance Safe. Annie Oak is going to talk about, I think, mediation and, I think she should talk about, yeah. Uh, yeah, risk reduction mediation. And then we're going to talk about philanthropy. So that's kind of the day you got in store for you. Thanks for braving the heat. Um, we've got fans and AC going as best we can. Okay, so and let, let me just say a word too. Um, David Bronner is in the house. Let's oh hey, David. Woo! Yeah, da David, David had the vision of creating this this uh, foam experience in a camp that is foam centric year after year. Where Zendo, which is an amazing, amazing project, also has its 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 foam home. And so thank you, David. Thank you, everything foam related. That's part of what's happening here today, too. All right. So without further ado, can we get uh, Rick Doblin and John Gilmore up here? So you may we're just going to do a quick, a quick fashion show here, which is you may notice these matching t-shirts that we have that say legalize Rick Doblin. And you may be wondering, where do these t-shirts come from? How many of you have uh, had a chance to watch Rick's TED Talk? Across, uh, 1 1 point oh, this uh, week at Burning Man is crossing 1.5 million views. He actually, he actually has a small earphone that tells him live how many views his TED Talk has. Um, it's, it's, it's better than drugs. Um, so we, I, I had the privilege of sitting in the front row at Rick's TED Talk wearing this t-shirt. The TED people got a little mad that I put the TED logo on it. Uh, and Nirvan Mullick, who's back here, who has been faithlessly following Rick around for, I don't know, decades, uh, is making a documentary about Rick that thankfully will only come out after MDMA is legalized. Uh, and if you want to support the film and get one of these beautiful t-shirts, uh, wait, what's the website again? Oh, hi, Dream. Dream's here, too. They're brother and sister. So prescriptionx.com, you can get one of these beautiful t-shirts and support the film. Yeah. And I'll just say why it's, so, uh, why it's so meaningful to me is that I identified as a counterculture drug-using criminal at age 17. That's who I thought I was, and so... I do want, <laughs> but one day I'll be legal. <laughs> and before that, before you guys get off, I really want to honor um, what Joe has done before. Um, in particular, trying to raise money from philanthropists for immigration reform, and it actually didn't work as the way you know it didn't succeed. But I think it was a success. I think it was a really important struggle, and you laid the groundwork for hopefully future progress. And he's ironically hoping that psychedelics will be more successful than immigration reform. <laughs> it's weird, but it seems easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let me introduce John Gilmore. Um, this is John Gilmore. John Gilmore is my, is my neighbor in San Francisco. And um, John has spent the last joined the maps board 15 years ago yeah. um, and showed up and gave a million dollars a year for 10 years to support 
all this work, has really dedicated his life to this, uh, helps keep Rick Doblin in check. <laughs> and uh, well, one of my favorite uh, fun facts about uh, John Gilmore is also co-founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation with the... Uh, <laughs> With the, the late, late, great departed John Perry Barlow. And um, one of my favorite John Gilmore facts, which you may or may not know, is you might think when you get an airplane you need to show ID. This is not true. If you refuse to show ID and ask for an extra pat down, they will do it. And it's kind of because of this guy. It's a funny story. You can ask him later. <laughs> um, so without further ado, uh, John, who is the actually newly elected chair of the MAPS board, as of the last board meeting. Uh, I'll let John uh, introduce Rick and do your guys' thing. Thanks, Joe. So how many people don't know who Rick Doblin is? I guess... <laughs> I guess my job is pretty much done. <laughs> Now, uh, if there's anyone responsible, if you could tie it down to one person responsible for restarting the cultural and scientific renaissance and medical renaissance of psychedelics, this is your man. <laughs> he, Rick has had many mentors, many collaborators. He's inspired whole generations of people to work with him on this. Um, but it's really Rick's perseverance and his vision all the way from when he was just a sprout <laughs> that uh, has driven this whole renaissance forward. And I'm not gonna take any more of your time. Listen to Rick. Well, really I'm just um, a link in a long chain and, and hopefully others of you will continue this link going forward. So while this is a talk, and I do have a lot of um, PowerPoint slides, what I want to say is that please ask questions at any time during the talk. There'll be people with microphones, and so you don't need to hold your questions to the end. I'd rather have it be a dialogue when you have questions, so please feel free at, at any point. Um, so let me see how this works, or if this works. Oh. No. Well. <laughs> okay, well. Okay. So um, when I was a sprout, when I was a college freshman, at um, age 17, I used to wear a T-shirt that said, uh, quest into the unknown, every time I was doing LSD or mescaline or something. So, uh, and I'd also wear glitter in my eyes, so my fr friends would know when I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I really wanted to um, start with this, just to uh, give a sense of what we're really involved in. We really are uh, questing into the unknown. We're trying to um, reintegrate psychedelics into society. And a lot of us um, have, I think, the um, mistaken idea that really we're trying to do this for the first time. And what I said, reintegrate is that psychedelics are the core of Western culture, the core of Greek culture, and the Eleusinian Mysteries was the longest running mystery ceremony in the history of the world. It lasted for 2,000 years, and there was a potion called Kikion that uh, is from uh, rye and ergot, and it's an LSD-like potion, and that was a central part of the ceremony, and it was wiped out in 396 by the Catholic Church because they wanted to have, um, they wanted the power of being the intermediary between people and the spiritual realm. And so ever since then, 396, psychedelics have been um, underground in a lot of ways. And one of the first things that the conquistadors did is that they criminalized peyote that the um, Indians were using in Mexico. So what we're really talking about is these thousands of year cycles and of trying to bring back psychedelics as a central part of Western culture to balance um, our intellect with our emotional and spiritual growth. So Einstein has said our technology has exceeded our humanity. 
And so we see that the technology without humanity is destroying the planet. And so what we need to do really is elevate our humanity, our spirituality, our empathy. And while there are many other ways to do it other than psychedelics or in addition to psychedelics, psychedelics are one of the most effective ways of doing it. Uh, next slide, please. I mean, if we could get this working, this would be good because there's um, a lot of slides I want to go through pretty quickly. Um, Oh, I didn't put it in. Oh. Um, well, I was a shy boy, and um, when I was um, 21, my, um, I lived in Florida, and there was um, the Humane Society had shut down this wild animal breeding operation, and the female wolf was pregnant and had a litter of eight wolves. And the zoos were full, and the sanctuaries were full, and they didn't know what to do, so they put an ad in the paper of who wanted to raise these wolves. And it was 100% Alaskan timber wolf. And so I said to them, um, I'd like to do it, but I'd like the most dominant of the litter in order for me to kind of gain my confidence. So I, I raised this wolf for two years. And wolves are um, born with their eyes closed, and they open them after a few days. And so during that period, after they were born, they were taken away from their wolf mother and bottle-fed by people from the Humane Society. So they bonded on people. And so I, I learned an awful lot from this wolf. And so I, I have some picture's uh, not part of this, uh, sort of the wild side of, of me learning that. And the wolves are wonderful, and they're, they're mis... Um, they're actually kind and gentle, and one of the main things about wolves, it's like psychedelics. They're feared, but they're feared for um, bad reasons, and the, the key thing about wolves is when they have the um, struggle for dominance, where the young wolf challenges the old wolf, um, they almost never kill the old wolf. They have a, a ritualized power struggle and the old wolf finds a new place in the pack, unlike humans where we kill off the leaders. So I've learned a lot from this wolf. And the main thing is to go straight ahead and to think about um, challenges as obstacles, as opportunity for exercise. Um, and so that's what I learned from my wolf. Um, but this was me when I was first starting to do LSD. And um, having a difficult time of it. Uh, I, I had the delusion, some of you may have shared it, that the more drugs you take, the quicker, the faster you evolve. And um, I was very disappointed to find out that's not true. <laughs> I gave it a good try. <laughs> um, but then I was uh, very confused, and so I went to the guidance counselor at college, this is 1972, and I said, help me with my um, psychedelic trips. They seem way more important than my classes. I seem stuck in my head and, and, and I felt the culture was the same way. And this was right after the backlash against psychedelics and the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. And this guidance counselor was actually really helpful and he said, tie a little string around your finger and every time you feel super spacey, just look at it and get grounded. But then, um, next slide please, he um, uh, gave me a book to read. And this was um, Realms of the Human Unconscious Observations from LSD Research by Stan Groff who was the foremost LSD researcher and theoretician, and still is, he's just turned 88, and has just written a new book, The Way of the Psychonaut, Encyclopedia for Inner Journeys, which we've just published, and we had a 750-person uh, book launch. Um, and so, you know, Stan said that the psychedelics are for the study of the mind, what the microscope is for biology and the telescope is for astronomy. And similar to the ways that the telescope has created discoveries, um, from, um, you know, Galileo that ran counter to the religious tradition. Also, we have uh, things that we've learned from psychedelics that do run counter to certain religious traditions, and there's been similar repression. So Stan is really the one that carried the thread during the dark periods of the 70s and 80s um, when psychedelic research was completely squashed, not just in the U.S. and around the world. So I really trace my inspiration to Stan and we owe him a lot of credit because what, what he has done is he developed a way through holotropic breath work to alter consciousness. Shilo, who's here, I think, is going to be doing some breath work workshops if any of you want to participate in them. And so what it demonstrates, this breath work, is that these kind of states of mind are within us. It's not like we take LSD and we have an LSD experience. We take LSD and we have an experience of ourselves liberated by LSD, reducing the kind of ego structure filters. And so you can do this with breath, with meditation. It's part of our human heritage. 
And Stan never denied the value of psychedelics during this period of time. And then most of the people that were interested, or a lot of the people interested in psychedelics, gravitated to Stan to learn the breath work. And that's where I uh, went from 88 to 90 with him to be the first group certified. But Stan is really the, the key inspiration, the key through line from the enormous amount of progress in the 50s and 60s with psychedelics. And then Stan sort of kept it alive. And then others of us who mostly learned from Stan brought it out starting in the 90s. Uh, next slide, please. So this was what happened after <laughs> Stan. Um, this is for those of you that um, are not from Chicago. This is Lakeshore Drive, L LSD. <laughs> so no access to Lake uh, to LSD. <laughs> um, and so it, it sort of was driven underground. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a few uh, images of the progress that we've made since then. That's incredible. So this is a slide, a very psychedelic kind of slide. Maria Sabina, mushrooms, ayahuasca, kind of a lit up brain. And this slide was made by the FDA, by the Division of Psychiatry Products, and at, at a talk that they gave, American Society for Clinical Psychopharmacology, just in May. So you can see that the FDA is really excited about this. And they have all sorts of guidance documents if you want to do research with anything, botanical medicines, with antidepressants. They have, so there's laws, there's regulations, and then there's guidance documents. And the guidance documents are to help the sponsors of drug development research know what FDA wants to do. And so they announced at this meeting that they're going to develop a guidance for psychedelic research. And they want us to help collaborate with them on creating it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's important to say that the FDA is our main ally, but it's not that they're pro-psychedelic, they're pro-science over drug war politics. And that's the key thing. Um, um, next slide, please. So here's another image. This was also in May. Um, this is Harvard Business School. And so George Goldsmith, who started the for-profit company Compass to develop psilocybin into a medicine for treatment-resistant depression, he and I gave a talk at Harvard Business School. So we're now um, facing a place where it's really entering into commerce. And if we look at what's happened with marijuana, once you get all these marijuana businesses, that's in some ways kind of the, the final step of integrating into culture. And so this is starting to happen with psychedelics. So Harvard Business School people are there looking for um, investment opportunities. We've um, only been funded by donations. We're gonna continue to do that for a while. At some point, it might make sense for us to take limited investors, but this was just to indicate that there is this um, openness in the um, investment community, which, which some people see as a, a, a bad thing, but I see it as a sign of our success. We've cleared out a lot of the political obstacles, the regulatory obstacles, so that you can develop, you can imagine a drug development plan from start to finish without all these unexpected blocks. So that's what happened. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Oh, <laughs> it'll come back. Yeah. Oh, good. A question. Um, Um, nonprofit drug development. So, and, and, and what I mean by that is that, uh, for example, with, um, it's going to get commodified. Um, but, but how we keep the spiritual aspect of it to it, I think that for-profit drug development, which we see now in S-ketamine, but the problem with S-ketamine for depression, which is considered the biggest breakthrough in, in uh, mental health in the last 30, 40 years, um, it's being portrayed as um, it's a pharmacological solution to a pharmacological problem. And they're, they're rarely providing S-ketamine with therapy. So the view is that if you did that, then you would need less ketamine sessions because you would be able to prepare and integrate more. So I think we want the for-profit drug development, but we want nonprofit alternatives to try to keep them in check. The other thing is the benefit corporation. And I'll, I'll share that, that there's a... Um, well, um, next slide, please. I'll get to the benefit court in just a second. So, it, strange allies. So, um, Joe, have you seen this one? Yes. Okay, take a look at this. So, this was, um, I went to see how many uh, views my TED Talk had. <laughs> Which are your broken? Uh, well, for a moment. So, 
this was on the TED website, and when I went to check, it's the National Security Agency is advertising for people for careers on a psychedelic talk. <laughs> it's shocking. I mean, so I, I assume that they actually have a deal with TED and they put it on all their TED talks. I don't know that they're thinking that psychedelic people are more likely to want to be spies. <laughs> but um, we do have underground experience. <laughs> Uh, but, but anyway, I think we, we, we need to recognize that, that there are these ways when we talk about mainstreaming into culture that it's going to be all aspects of culture. And, and this was just a total shock to me. Um, uh, next slide, please. So w why is this? Why do we really care? And I'd say this is what um, came to me when I was um, 18 years old. Counterculture, drug using, criminal, despair at the murderous nature of the human heart. And I realized that um, with psychedelics, it's possible to feel um, beyond ego states, to feel a sense of connection with everything that is, with nature, with history, with evolution. And it's similar to what the astronauts saw when they looked down at the Earth from space. And so if you have that perspective that we're all in this together, then it's harder to dehumanize others. It's harder to trash the environment. And so I felt as a political strategy, that psychedelic mystical experience is the most important way that I could think of to help people change their attitudes and not just think. So uh, Rita Marley had a great album um, and it was called Who Feels It Knows It. And so we can have these intellectual ideas and that's a lot of the challenge of psychoanalysis. You could understand your problems but if you don't feel them and work through them emotionally you're going to be stuck. And so it's about how to help people feel this sense of connection at such a deep level that it embraces and generates compassion and empathy and all one love. And so this theory of change that I came up with and others, you know, a lot of the people in the 60s all had this idea, but this was validated in 1983 by Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And he ended up writing this book saying that we have the United Nations to mediate conflicts between countries but a lot of the conflicts are religious based and we need people to go beyond fundamentalism to think about religions as languages and there are different ways to express things but they're all coming from the same place of the human heart and the need to communicate and so we don't need to kill people if they have different symbol systems or different beliefs. And so Robert Mueller wrote this book from his perch at the Assistant Secretary General of the UN but he didn't say anything about psychedelics. So I wrote him a letter and I said, look at all the psychedelic research, would you help us bring psychedelic research back? And I, I felt like I was a, a stranded sailor on a deserted island putting a note in a bottle and throwing it into the current and um, he answered me back. And he said yes, he would help. So this theory of change I think has been validated by uh, peacemakers like Robert Mueller. And then, next slide please. Um, so. I didn't know at the time about MDMA, so I think not only do we need to have this uh, experience of unity and connection, but we also need to work through all the multi-generational traumas through epigenetics and other kind of ways that we inherit um, certain kind of um, anxiety levels, fear levels, trauma levels, maybe even specific memories and we end up um, seeing the world through these filters. And so this was um, neuroscientists at Stanford published a call to action for the world's neuroscientists in Cell, which is one of the most important scientific journals, saying the world's populations need more compassion and empathy for one another. The study of MDMA provides one small but potentially important step towards reaching that goal. So this is something I could have written. I was shocked to see neuroscientists not just talking about understanding how the brain works, but really how do we generate more empathy and compassion. Uh, next slide, please. And now they just published um, in June, Disruptive Psychopharmacology. So we hear about disruptive technology from our friends in tech all the time. So this was now Disruptive Psychopharmacology about psilocybin and um, methylene dioxide, methamphetamine, or MDMA. So this was published in JAMA Psychiatry, one of the most important scientific journals for psychiatry. So this idea, this embrace of psychedelics as disrupting the traditional um, pharmacological solutions from Big Pharma about take this pill and take it every day for the rest of your life. So really we've reached this place of uh, being given this opportunity to go forward and it's seen by mainstream psychiatry. Next slide please. 
So here's the public benefit corporation. So what I realized um, when I started MAPS, I, I didn't understand that I thought everything, w MAPS would become generic. The MDMA, if we made it into a medicine, it was patented by Merck in 1912, so it's off patent. And in the 1980s, um, when I started MAPS, the same year of 1986 where I started MAPS, Burning Man started also. <laughs> And then um, another company started developing uh, Ibogaine for opiate addiction, and they decided to go the for-profit route. And so um, they ended up having different researchers developing new things, and all of them trying to patent them, and then it devolved into lawsuits so, and fights over intellectual property. So I went to the uh, patent lawyer for the Ibogaine people, and I said, I want an anti-patent strategy so nobody could patent any uses of MDMA. And so we developed that as well, which means, <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 basically it, it means that we collect stories of people who have been healed from different things from MDMA, we put them on our website, then nobody else can claim to have invented the idea. All right, but I learned later on, uh, it, only about eight years ago actually, that um, there was a, a program that uh, Ronald Reagan had created um, to provide incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And so that meant that we would have a particular period of time where we would be the only ones that could use our data to sell MDMA as a medicine. So then I started realizing that we could tell a different story to donors. We're not like most nonprofits, like if you want to feed the hungry or help the refugees or any number of different things, it's an unending need unless you can get governments to kind of adopt and pay for it. So we were different in the sense that we would have a product at the end that we could potentially make money off of, not at exorbitant rates the way Big Pharma does, but at some uh, reasonable rate, and that then we could use that to fund more research. And so we had this virtuous circle. So MAPS, people make donations, get nonprofit uh, tax deductions, and then we invest in the Benefit Corp. And the thing about the Benefit Corp is that it's a modification of capitalism there's thousands of these now. And what you can do is you maximize public benefit, not profit. If you're a normal for-profit company, uh, shareholders can sue the management if they're not maximizing profit. And there was just a statement, came out about two weeks ago by some of the leading CEOs in America saying that they question this whole idea of maximizing profit. You have to take stakeholders into account. So even the uh, essence of capitalism, people are realizing that the profit maximizing motive causes a lot of terrible side effects, in including destruction of the environment. Yeah. yeah, you want to change the mic? Is this any better? No. The speaker. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I should just keep going. I'm sorry. Okay, so anyway, we have the Public Benefit Corporation, and we started that in December 2014, and that was both to um, communicate to us and to others that we anticipate success, because we didn't really need to create this until we had a product. And then we also learned we're trying to model a new way to market drugs. So that gets at the commodification question a little bit, where you really maximize public benefit. And then the other thing our tax attorneys and accountants told us is that when you spend money from a uh, nonprofit, it's a mission-related expense. But when you s spend it from a for-profit, it's a tax loss carry forward. So we're going to be shielding around $40 million of the first income from the sale of MDMA from taxes. And at 21% or so, that's $8 million. So we're, we are working within the system. We're willing to take tax breaks, but we should also pay taxes for that. Um, I guess we'll get another slide. A any questions at this point? Um, I think that the Benefit Corp is a really, really important thing. And what we've been um, learning is that we, we might not be able, or we probably won't be able to take for-profit um, pharmaceutical companies and turn, they probably won't want to turn into Benefit Corps, but if we demonstrate best practices, um, there's a good chance that they'll follow some of those practices uh, voluntarily. So, yeah. What? Okay, next slide. Great. No, no, she, she has a question. Oh, oh sorry, go ahead. No. So, so let me just repeat the oh, question. Okay. So the question is, does this 
um, anti-patent strategy mean that once we make MDMA into a medicine that anybody who can get medical grade MDMA could sell it? So the answer is no. And that's because of uh, good old Ronald Reagan. So what he did in 84 well, is he- Let's give Ronald Reagan an applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what he did was, he, he, what, what, what it means is this data exclusivity. Uh, next slide, please. So this was in 84, very obscure. I, I, um, and so what it means is that for five years, no one can use our data to market a generic. But because there's no patent protection, other companies could generate their own data. But they can't use our data. And it will take them at least five years to generate their data. So probably we will not have any competition for MDMA for PTSD for this period of five years. Plus, a lot of drugs are tested in adults and marketed to children without any uh, research in children. And so the FDA provides incentives so you get an extension of six months on data exclusivity if you do work in kids. And the FDA is actually requiring us, great, to do research in adolescents with trauma. So if we succeed in adults, we must go to uh, 12 to 17 year olds. And if that works, then we have to go down to seven to 11 year olds. And so that's actually the heart of the drug war now is we gotta protect kids from drugs and you know one dose screws up their brain, but trauma changes people's brains a lot. And so the FDA is saying to us, uh, go ahead and we've actually had to file a plan that they've had to agree to about our work with adolescents post-approval. And then since no one can apply for five and a half years for GMP, it takes FDA at least six months or so to review the application. So chances are we'll have a six-year period. And in Europe, it's eight to 10 years of data exclusivity. Um, but we're, we're not patenting anything. All of our documents, our protocols, everything are online. So if anybody wanted to make MDMA into medicine, they've got a head start building out of what we've already done. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the uh, future vision of MAPS. Um, and so the nonprofit is at the bottom. Um, the black lines are things that MAPS owns or will potentially control. And the dotted lines are uh, from the MAPS Public Benefit Corp. We have what we call uh, the refugees from Big Pharma. And we have an incredible team uh, led by people from Novartis. We have almost an all female led team, all from Novartis. And. <laughs> Um, with a different style of management than I have, <laughs> I, would, I would say. <laughs> um, more collaborative, less directive. Um, and so, so, so... Some people might call it management. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> so the dotted lines are where the staff of the Benefit Corp will do the work. So we have MAPS Europe, which we've just started here. Eric Verbenton, who's right there, is um, on the board of it. Um, Eric said the only way he would be on the board is if we refused to pay him. <laughs> so I said, of course, I'd be glad to refuse to pay you. <laughs> um, and so we needed a company in Europe to make MDMA do medicine in Europe, future global companies in different countries. The Benefit Corp runs our training program, our therapy training program, and also expanded access, which is going to be compassionate use, which is going to start later this year. And then the things on the right are future potential expansions with cannabis, with ibogaine, with ayahuasca. And so there's all sorts of issues about that, about taking things that have been used in religious traditions in other countries and turning them into sort of Western medicines. But I believe that that's a healthy conversation we could have, but I think you can have respect for where something came from and then modify it for your current cultural situation. And so I, I come from the Reformed Jewish tradition, and that's the essence of it. That it's your obligation to take the tradition and refine it and bring it up to date to what makes sense to you now, not just slavishly follow the tradition. So I think these are tools, iboga, cannabis, uh, ayahuasca are, are uh, from uh, Africa or from uh, the Amazon, but they're a part of humanity's gift from nature. And I th so we're talking about medicalizing these drugs which will be um, helpful for people. Hopefully then insurance would cover their treatments, but there should be other ways for people to get it other than through medicine. Okay, so, but this is sort of the future vision and this is um, only after we've focused enough on MDMA for PTSD to get that into a medicine. So these are all sort of really on the slow burner, just sm slow developments. Okay, next slide please. Um, so it's very important to have bipartisan support. I think it's absolutely essential for humanity's survival that we bring these psychedelic tools forward. And it's also important to recognize that those people that we have demonized are not monolithic, they're not all bad, they're not, it's not black and white. And if people from different 
political strains want to support what we're doing, we should reach a hand out. We should be. Um, <laughs> so, um, of, of all the things that I've done that, um, uh, well, I've done a lot of things, a small set of things I've got criticized for, and the one that I've got criticized for the most was taking money from Rebecca Mercer. So Rebecca donated a million dollars over four years. Her only uh, string attached was it's only for veterans. But we have enough veterans in our phase three studies. And she was the main funders of Trump, of uh, Steve Bannon. They, they owned, her family owned Cambridge Analytica. But they were willing to support MAPS. So next slide, please. Um, also, uh, the Koch brothers. So um, Elizabeth Koch, whose father is Charles Koch, um, she actually recently pledged 900000 a year for three years um, for us to buy a pile of uh, MDMA. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it, it's actually roughly $5.6 million for us to get 15 kilos of medical grade MDMA. So uh, for anybody here who's a researcher, we have free medical grade MDMA to distribute. If you have the proper DEA approvals or if you're in any foreign countries, we've got MDMA for researchers all over the world. And it's thanks to Elizabeth Koch and uh, her father, Charles Koch. So it's really important. The Next slide, please. We also have support from George Soros from the Open Society Foundation. So we go sort of from right to left. And George just um, donated $70,000 for a training program for therapists of color. Because we've noticed that all of the people in our phase two studies have been, uh, there's not a single African American. And there's a lot of reasons why African Americans are suspicious of uh, doing uh, work with uh, medical research. And if you look in this room, there's hardly any African Americans. The whole psychedelic community is largely white. I think there's good reasons for that. My understanding is, is to say that um, it's a dodgy kind of thing. You do risk jail. You, you have to be somewhat secure and privileged to take the risks of getting involved with psychedelics because it makes you defenseless in certain ways. So I think people that feel constantly threatened by society are less likely to let those defenses down. Rick, so, do you want to mention the Kentucky training? Yeah, we just had a training. Um, so not only, so George Soros just started uh, this with $70,000. Then we got $90,000 from the Libra Foundation, which is the Pritzker family, Joby Pritzker. We actually have six members of the MAPS board of directors. Four of them are in this room um, right now. Joby is here at Burning Man somewhere else, I think. Um, and then uh, we have a sixth woman who's going to be uh, coming to Burning Man in the future, <laughs> I think. But we got uh, additional funds from Dr. Bronner's, um, from Cody Swift, River Sticks, and so we just had a training for therapists of color in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So we're really trying to do what we can to uh, make this available to marginalized populations. But again, it's to say that we span the political spectrum, and what just recently happened is that Charles Koch and George Soros joined together on a project and mutually funded it. So these kind of divisions are not as clear. Um, next slide, please. So this is just to give you a sense. MAPS is now 58 people or so. It changes almost every week, every day. So this is the MAPS side. We do fundraising, the executive team, communications, media, operations, the Zendo project is part of MAPS. And then we have a small advocacy team. Um, next slide, please. And then this is uh, the clinical research team um, with the people at the top are the managers, uh, and there's now three or four more people there since I made the slide. Next slide, please. And then these are our principal investigators for phase three, and next slide, well, like three or four in a row. This is just to show you that we've been training lots of therapists, um, people all over the world, and we've trained several hundred therapists in how to work with MDMA in our particular method. One more, please. Uh, again, so it's just expanding. This was Europe. Next one, please. This was in Asheville and then um, in Israel. So we've made incredible progress in Israel. Um, the Ministry of Health of Israel, um, everybody there has PTSD from um, multi-generational trauma or from wars or from being under the uh, potential missiles from, uh, that come from Gaza sometimes and stuff. So there's an incredible documentary that we're showing Thursday at 9 called Trip of Compassion. And it's the most patient-centered documentary ever made about how MDMA works. And it's about three of our Israeli patients with English subtitles. So it's really terrific, but that documentary has changed every a the attitudes in Israel with the police, the Ministry of Health, um, all aspects of society. And so now the Ministry of Health has approved 50 patients on a compassionate basis while we do phase three. 
and that's going to cost a million dollars, $20,000 a patient, and the Ministry of Health is putting up half a million dollars worth of services, facilities, and staff time, and we've raised 425000 already to match that. So this is the first government funding from, for psychedelic uh, therapy treatment coming Woo! from Israel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, next slide, please. All right, and then this was recently in Colorado. Keep going. Um, all right, so I'm just going to give you a brief sense of what we're doing other than PTSD. We, we, we did a small study. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, what are the qualifications by FDA for who can be an MDMA therapist? Do they have to be a psychiatrist or not? So we are currently debating FDA about that. But our, our fundamental perspective, so the way that we designed our studies was to maximize therapeutic outcome. We felt with something so controversial, uh, we needed to show that it was as good as possible. So we weren't so much thinking about economics, we were thinking about how do we get the best results. And so for many different reasons, we have a two-person team and we, in general, like it to be a male-female, but it can be non-gender, non-binary, it can be two women, it can be transgender, whatever. But the basic idea is that it's a two-person team. And that provides safety for, uh, particularly if, if women have been uh, sexually abused, to have a male therapist, they might not feel you know, as safe to have a female there. But also we find that a lot of the people that um, are traumatized, most people that are traumatized don't develop PTSD. Most of us are resilient. But it turns out that those people that tend to get uh, PTSD, most of them, or a lot of them, have had a series of traumas, often going back to childhood. And uh, attachment issues, abandonment issues, uh, physical abuse from parents. And so you might be talking to a veteran about war, and this has happened uh, very frequently, is somebody will talk about how um, they saw people killed, they felt totally helpless, and then the next second they're talking about how when their father beat them up when they were little. So that having kind of a well-functioning parental kind of a space uh, support makes a big difference. And also it's, you know, sometimes the person will talk to the woman, to the man. So the issue is one of them has to have a license as a therapist or be a psychiatrist, but does not have to be, so it's not a psychiatrist. So there's a different negotiations that FDA have had with the psilocybin teams. So for the psilocybin team, they say that the lead person needs to either be a doctor or a PhD. And the second person needs to have a bachelor's degree and gone through the training of the sponsor, but doesn't need any particular degree. So that's for psilocybin. But we objected and said, we don't think that the lead person needs to be a doctor or a PhD. In fact, clinical psychologists are trained in therapy and research. And they might have less experience in therapy than psychologists that do that all the time, master's level psychologists. So what we say is, and what the FDA has agreed, is that one person is either um, a psychiatrist or licensed as a therapist, or, um, and the second person, and this is where we're arguing back and forth right now, we wanted them to have uh, been through our training program and have no other requirements. Basically, we want it to be an apprenticeship model so the two therapist, two person team is, is more expensive and how do we get insurance companies to pay for it? So if it's used as the apprentice model where the second person is learning as a student, learning to be a therapist without a license, that's how we want it to be. But the FDA has not yet said yes to that. David, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat what David said. So Ron Beller, who I think is, is he here? Uh, anyway, he's camping with us. So, so Ron has done incredible work helping to raise this 425,000 and he's trying to raise the other 75 to match the Israeli Ministry of Health. But also, uh, and I'll talk about it a bit more later, Ron has been raising money for um, um, helping the Palestinians. And so he just recently had a traumatic event himself where he was in the West Bank with a group of activists, uh, Jews, Israelis, American Jews, Israelis, and Palestinians, and they were um, viciously attacked by the Israeli army. So it was really a shock for Ron to uh, think of himself as protected in a way by the Israeli army and then have himself become a victim. So we, we are um, grateful for Ron for doing that. Hey, hey Rick, just time, you have about 15 minutes left. Oh, okay.
Well, in, in Europe, um, they're basically um, following the FDA model. So whatever we negotiate with FDA, we'll probably be able to get in Europe. But it's different country by country. So we've negotiated with the European Medicines Agency, and we still now have to negotiate with the different countries. And, and we've just got permission in the Czech Republic, and we're almost there in the Netherlands. And, and so um, over time, I think it will relax who the second person is. Next. So we, oh, we're, so we did a study, a small study with autistic adults with social anxiety. It worked great. We did a study with MDMA with life-threatening illnesses. It also worked well. Next, um, we're starting a study with MDMA for eating disorders with a donor from Canada with three sites. We've done work with Ibogaine, observational studies in New Zealand, and the next one, please, in Mexico, and now we're developing. Um, I think for, for political scientific reasons, what we need to do from the psychedelic community is show that we're trying to address uh, national crises. And so PTSD is a national crisis. Veterans are committing suicide 20 a day. But we have a, another national crisis, which is um, last year more people died of drug overdoses. More Americans died of drug overdoses last year than Americans died in all of Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So it's a devastating statistic. And there's also sociologists have looked at counties that have what are called despair deaths. So despair deaths are deaths from alcoholism, suicide, and drug overdoses. And there's a correlation between counties where there's more despair deaths and more votes for Trump. So the question is, how do we reach out to Trump supporters who are motivated by fears and anxieties of changing cultures, and many of them often um, in areas where there's lots of drug abuse as a solution? How do we both help them and spiritualize them at the same time, and also address a national crisis? And I think I began for opiate addiction is a way to bring that forward. So we're now going to start a pre-IND meeting with FDA. Uh, to take this from observational to inside the lab. And Ibogaine is deadly. It can affect the heart, but under medicalized circumstances, I think it can be safely controlled. And I'll just say that in 1985, I had an Ibogaine experience, and it was one of the most important psychedelic experiences of my whole lives. So we're sort of on the slow track to bring back Ibogaine. Next. Um, and this is a new woman that we've just added to the board of directors who's uh, going to be uh, hopefully coming to Burning Man in a few years. So she worked for FDA for five years. Her name is Victoria Hale. Um, then she worked for Genentech, which is a big for-profit pharmaceutical company. She got tired of that. She, then she started her own non-profit pharmaceutical company called One World Health for drugs for Africa, parasites, various things like that. And she got $150 million from the Gates Foundation. And while that was working, she got a call from the Buffett family, and they said, would you like to develop low-cost contraceptives for the world? And so she said yes, they funded her, very, very well funded, and she started Medicines 360 and developed a hormonal IUD at very low cost. Um, and then she started exploring ayahuasca on her own for personal growth purposes, and now she's interested in making ayahuasca into a medicine. So we're bringing incredible expertise from nonprofit pharma into MAPS to help us both really move forward the full ways with MDMA for PTSD and other indications, and also she'll help us with ayahuasca and uh, ibogaine. Next, please. So we're, we've also done uh, the first studies uh, of marijuana for um, PTSD and 76 veterans. Luckily, uh, a lot of people in Colorado smoke marijuana, and they uh, paid a bunch of taxes, and so they put out 10 million for research. We got 2.1 million to do a study with marijuana and 76 veterans. Next slide, please. It was four different kinds of marijuana. Um, you know, TC, CBD, combination, placebo. We're just writing up the results of that study. But next slide, please. What's really important is that we've been working since 1999. So to end the government monopoly on the supply of marijuana for research. So why we have all these state marijuana laws and we don't have marijuana medicine in plant form federally is that starting in 1968, um, the University of Mississippi was given a license to grow marijuana under contract to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse provides it to researchers, but they cannot provide it as a prescription medicine for sale for commercial purposes. And in phase three research, which is where we're at with MDMA, you have to use the exact same drug you want to market. So as long as this monopoly exists, there's no way to make the plant into a medicine in the US with domestic supplies. And at this point, there's no foreign producer that has gotten the FDA to accept their product, so we can't import either. So we've been trying since 2000 to break the government monopoly. This is the last political obstruction to psychedelic or marijuana research. So I think symbolically and important for this, we have to break this monopoly. So just two days ago, 
Um, well, in uh, August of 2016, under Obama, the DEA, after lots of pressure from us, lawsuits against the DEA, they agreed to end the monopoly. And then when Trump got elected and Sessions got appointed Attorney General, he blocked the whole thing. And then Barr has been blocking the whole thing as well. But there was a lawsuit that Sue Sisley filed, and the courts um, said that the DEA had to respond within 30 days, and that was several days ago. And so the DEA just several days ago said that they are gonna license more companies, and that this domestic production of federally legal marijuana that could become a medicine through the FDA will become a reality. On the other hand, they just said that. They've been sitting on these applications for three years, so we're not sure when they're actually gonna act, but they've lost all justification, so it's coming forward. Um, I think I have a little bit, Sarah and uh, Ryan gave me a little bit, maybe if I could have like 15 minutes of their time, just to keep going. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, so we're near the end of the road for the night of Monopoly. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and we're also doing this work with Israel and Palestine. It turns out there's a bunch of Israelis and Palestinians doing ayahuasca together illegally underground. And there's also therapists in the West Bank that work with MDMA that prepare Palestinians to work through their trauma for them to be in mixed spaces with Israelis. So we want to study this. And um, you know, just a, so um, we're being inundated by people who want to invest. We really don't want investors. But there was someone that offered uh, mega, mega tens of millions of dollars. And um, I said, no. And he said, why did you say no? I said, well, where were you for the first 32 of our 33 years when we needed money and no investors would do it? But also, we want the money to come from the sale of MDMA for things that investors won't do, that are sort of do doesn't make financial sense, but is pioneering. And he said, well, what's, this is Christian Angermeyer. He said, well, what are one of those things? I said, the thing that would be the hardest of all that we're doing to monetize is this piecework for um, Israelis and Palestinians. It's, it's, it's not a business, it's, it's just about um, trying to prepare a better world. And so Christian said, well, all right, how much is that? And I said, well, it's 100,000 pounds for years two and three, 100,000 pounds in each of those two years. And Christian hesitated only for a few seconds. And he said, okay, I'll donate that. So I, I lost a $50 million investment, but I gained $250,000 as a donation, and I think it was a great deal. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, we're doing it in association with Robin Card Harris and Lior Roseman, who are at the Imperial College in London, and it's with the University of Haifa. And so we're starting to try to understand how you do conflict resolution, how it can be um, amplified in a way by both ayahuasca and MDMA. Ayahuasca again to help this communal sense, and then MDMA to work through your individual traumas. Um, next slide, please. So we're making MDMA into a medicine. That's our main thing. The next thing. Um, so, goes back to, uh, I learned about MDMA in 1982 when I was um, at Esalen. I dropped out of college for 10 years to get grounded. It took me that time, that, it took me a whole decade to integrate my psychedelic experiences. As I said, I took a whole bunch really fast and needed time to integrate. And so I, when I went back to college, I went to Esalen to study with Stan Groff again. And um, while I was there, this young woman, um, so this is, a young woman came by and said, um, here's a new drug called uh, Adam. That was the code name. It was used as a therapy drug before it was a party drug. And she said, it helps you feel love. It helps you feel connection. It helps you talk to people. And I thought, I feel love. I'm in love. I can talk to people. You know, I'm used to LSD where you take the right dose and then you can't talk <laughs> for a whole period of time. Um, just to say, one of my favorite albums, if any of you have um, uh, David Crosby from Crosby Bastille's National Young, he made this in the late 60s. It's one of the best 60s albums with everybody from all the different groups. But the name of the album is If I Could Only Remember My Name. <laughs> so that's what I was used to. So I was uh, foolish enough to underestimate MDMA, but smart enough to buy some. <laughs> and uh, I took it home, did it with my girlfriend, and was amazed how profound it was and then said, okay, I, I woke up to LSD after the backlash, but now I'm waking up to MDMA before the backlash, and so I started getting politically involved in organizing the uh, people in the psychedelic community. And so the DEA, when they moved to criminalize MDMA in the summer of 84, there's a 30-day period to get a, um, to file for a hearing. So on day 29, there's me in the background there spying on the DEA, right before I walked in the door to ask for the hearing, and we were granted the hearing, next slide please, and then, um, through Robert Miller, who had introduced me to various people, we were having 
Um, unlikely people speak to the media. So the first article about MDMA in a public way was Newsweek and brother David Steindlerost, who's now 93, um, was willing to do half doses of MDMA in a Roman Catholic monastery um, for aiding meditation. And he said to Newsweek, a monk spends his whole life cultivating the same awakened attitude MDMA gives you. And I also um, was introduced to my favorite rabbi, next slide please, and uh, one of Joe's favorite rabbis too, Zalvin Schachter. He actually did LSD with Tim Leary, but uh, he hadn't done MDMA until I got it to him. And he compared it to the Sabbath. And this was in the Washington Post. You call the Sabbath a delight. MDMA is like the Sabbath at the end of a long week. So um, I just want to remind you all that Sabbath is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so we were winning in the court of public opinion, winning in the courts, DEA freaked out, next slide please, and um, emergency scheduled MDMA in the summer of 85. And so the irony there is that the first legal act to criminalize MDMA was a crime. DEA did not have the power to do this. And various people that were arrested figured this out and they were all let go. The attorney general had the power but he never subdelegated it down to the head of the DEA. But this was now 86, uh, 85, I mean, then 86, we won the case. The judge said, yes, it should be a medicine, but the administrative law judge only recommends. The administrator of the DEA rejected the recommendation, and it was criminalized. And so we lost, eventually we won twice, lost the third time in the appeals court. And I realized the only way through was through science, through medicine, through the FDA. So in 86 is when I started MAPS. That's me and the woman on the right. Debbie is the one that first gave me MDMA. Uh, <laughs> uh, next slide, please. All right, so briefly how it works um, is that um, PTSD changes your brain. Um, you have um, hyperactive amygdala, the fear processing part of your brain. Your prefrontal cortex, where you think logically, is not as active. So you're fear-based, but you're not logically thinking. You, you can have a sound that reminds you of something else, but normally we would be able to separate that out. It's not the trauma, but you're not as logical, can't do that. And then the hippocampus, where we store memories into long-term, is reduced activity in a way. So PTSD changes your brain, and MDMA changes it back in almost the exact opposite way. Next slide. So uh, MDMA reduces activity in the amygdala so that we can um, take fearful memories and process them and not recoil, but we can approach them, we can touch them, we can experience them and let them out. MDMA increases activity in the prefrontal cortex so we can, again, think more logically. and it increases connectivity between the amygdala and the hippocampus. So we can take memories that are sort of stuck in short-term memory and file them away in long-term storage. Next. Um, it also releases all these hormones, including oxytocin, prolactin, vasopressin, and oxytocin is nursing mothers. It's the hormone of love. The next slide. Um, and so there was a, how many of you have heard of the octopus study? Okay, a bunch of you have, but I'll just share that uh, neuroscientists at Johns Hopkins uh, humans and octopuses diverged more than 500 million years ago. And so the question was, they do have serotonin neurons, Ox uh, octopuses do. And so the question was, does MDMA have any effect in octopuses? And how deep in our evolutionary line does it go? Um, and so they gave MDMA to a bunch of octopuses. We sent them the MDMA. Next slide, please. They developed, this is the technique. So they have an octopus in a three-chambered uh, device and the octopus could go one way or the other. In one of them, there's a ball trapped in a little cage, an inanimate object, and the other is another octopus that can't move. And they've done this with all different gender switching, um, gender blender, you could say. <laughs> they, they blended the genders, and under all circumstance, the octopus spends more time with the inanimate object than with the other octopus. Next slide, please. But you soak the octopus in a bath of MDMA water. <laughs> And it, it took them a while to get the dose quite right, <laughs> but they did. And then you stick the octopus back, and lo and behold, the octopus wants to hang out with the other octopuses. So when we talk about using MDMA in adolescence and using MDMA in seven to 11-year-olds, I think it's gonna work because it doesn't require verbal skills. This pro-social aspect of MDMA is pre-verbal. It's deep in our evolutionary history. And this octopus study helps demonstrate that. Um, next slide, please. These, these same researchers from Johns Hopkins also did studies in mice, and they showed that MDMA um, releases uh, oxytocin, which generates uh, nerve terminal growth and, and creation of new neural connections. 
during this critical period. So it sort of reopens this social reward learning where people are more open to being connected with others. And so this was Nature, the top scientific journal in the world, published this. Next, please. Um, so now I'm going to show you just a short video. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so the question I think is, is how do you help the, the adolescents with the come down from MDMA? So, you know, people normally think, yeah, you, you have this depression or so after MDMA, but we don't see that in the research. And so we see the actually low mood more in the control group than in the MDMA group. Because the control group are people struggling with PTSD, then we're asking them to confront the trauma, they don't have the fear reduction and the help from MDMA, and then they're disturbed afterwards. But the difference between recreational use where people have a lot of this depletion is that we give MDMA during the day, so that people, we have overnight stays so people can sleep that night. We have more integrative psychotherapy the next day. And so we help people process it and we tell them it's a two day experience. So people do need to rest after MDMA, but we build the rest into the therapeutic program. And so they can't drive the next day, somebody has to come get them, they do more therapy. So we, we tend not to see that. So I think in adolescence, it's an unknown, we'll have to explore that, but we call people every day uh, initially, we called them every day on the phone for a week after MDMA, so after they go home. Now it's only going to be four times a week, so we stay in close touch. If they feel disturbed, they can come for more therapy, but usually then it'll be once a week for their next MDMA session. So this is a, a, just a two-minute video. We'll see if it works. And this is about an actual veteran who was a machine gunner in Iraq, and his problem was rage. He came back. Uh, from Iraq and he was very very traumatized and he would erupt in a rage. He never beat his wife But he threw things at her. He made her cry. It was horrible And so this is his first session with 75 milligrams and, and we'll see if this works um, Well Okay, it's not working, but we can skip this, but I would recommend that you see Trip of Compassion if you wanted to see this. But what you're seeing here is that um, he's able to converse. It's, most people really don't understand the difference between LSD, psilocybin, and MDMA. I, I, I would assume many people here do <laughs> know the difference, but most people out in the world and most therapists that we talk to just think of psychedelic as EO dissolving, and so MDMA is really different. In a... MDMA session of eight hours long, roughly half the time people's eyes are closed, they're listening to music, they're basically healing themselves. And then the other half of the time they're talking with the therapist, and that's also very healing as well. In psilocybin or LSD sessions, it's about 90% time without words, people having internal experience, and the rest of the time is dialogue with therapists. And so what you'll, you would have seen here is just how he's able to talk about his trauma, about his rage, and people are very able, there's a uh, internal family systems is a, a therapeutic approach that's about how we're all collections of different parts and you need to build, like your internal family needs to be connected. And so we see that in this, he talks about the rage as a part of him that he is displaced and then it's trying to kill him because he's trying to suppress it and he has to make friends with this rage part of himself and does and that's part of his healing. Okay, next slide please. So. Um, this is uh, 2016, there was um, 868,000 vets disabled with PTSD and another 600,000 with other mental health disorders. This is now much higher. In September 2018, the VA said that they had 1,036,000 veterans receiving disability payments for PTSD. Next slide. We guess that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 billion a year that they're putting just, so think about the cost of war. That's just PTSD almost 30 billion for all mental disorders. I don't know if these numbers are accurate because they're not putting out the numbers, but it's in this range. Maybe we can find out one day what the real numbers are. But the point is, these are mostly young people. And these are gonna be payments disabled for the next 40, 50 years. And so when we think about the cost of war, not, not even talking about the emotional cost and the destroyed lives and families, but it's also this financial cost. And yet, we have not gotten a single penny from the VA or the Department of Defense to do research. However, Rachel Yehuda, who is here, is going to try to change that and try to get some support from the VA.
So we're willing to take money from uh, Rebecca Mercer, Char the Koch family, and we would also take it from the VA. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So um, we're doing work as a strategic thing. So first off, we're a little bit humble about, uh, well, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> about whether our method is the best. It's based on this idea that there's an inner healer. We all know that if you hurt your body, it heals itself unconsciously. We don't know how to do that. We think that there's something similar with the psyche. And so when we give MDMA in a therapeutic setting, we just, um, we don't have a structure to it. We use a lot of techniques, but we follow the patient. We, what comes up is from this inner healer. But we are very interested in educating VA-trained therapists who've developed other non-drug psychotherapies to learn about the potential of MDMA. And maybe you can blend MDMA with some of these other therapies and be more effective than what we're doing, or only have one MDMA session instead of three, which is our model. So, but it's more for teaching the VA. So we're paying money to give VA-affiliated researchers the opportunity to blend MDMA with their therapies. The first one was uh, Candace Monson, who was in charge of uh, women's health at the Boston VA. Now she's in Ryerson in Toronto, and it was called Cognitive Behavioral Conjoint Therapy. Um, and that means, conjoint means couples. It's where one member of the couple has PTSD, but it affects the relationship. And so we've been able to give both members of the couple MDMA. And so we've gone from one to two. It's beautiful therapy, and it's worked great, and now they wanna uh, expand it. Next, so we also are blending um, Cognitive processing therapy is another of the one that thousands of uh, therapists in the VA have been trained in that. And this, uh, Ann Wagner is a student uh, protege of uh, Candace Monson, so we're starting this study soon in Canada. Next, and we're also working with prolonged exposure. Uh, Barbara Rothbaum, who's one of the uh, experts in the US at Emory, is gonna be soon starting to blend MDMA with prolonged exposure. And also the uh, queen of PTSD research, um, Edna Foa. Um, who developed prolonged exposure. In 2009, uh, I was with her with Michael Midhofer, our lead psychiatrist at a conference on PTSD in Jerusalem. She said, MDMA is terrible, it's dynamite in the brain, give it up, go to VR. And there was a guy there that was uh, doing VR, funded by the military, and uh, Skip Rizzo, and I went to Skip and I said, uh, Edna says MDMA is terrible, um, you know, I should use VR. And he just started laughing and he said, if you have MDMA, you don't need VR. <laughs> because you do your own imagery, your own exact memories, and that's what you really need. But now, a few months ago, we had lunch, uh, or dinner actually, in Tel Aviv, and we've trained some of her Israeli protégés, and now Edna is gonna do a study blending MDMA with prolonged exposure. Woo! So, uh, I, I called it the queen has fallen. <laughs> Rick, five. Just, okay, five minutes, next please. And here's Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, Rachel's gonna use our method, but she's gonna compare two sessions versus three sessions. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and we're also starting to be group therapy. So the big question is, again, for equity, how do we reduce the cost? We wanna study group therapy, but all of the studies that the VA have done have shown that individual therapy works better than group therapy. There's shame involved, you need to tell your story, so we're gonna explore this at UCSF. Uh, with probably a group of just six people with Brian Anderson, and they're also doing work with psilocybin with groups as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's a study. This is the, John Gilmore um, has pressed us for years. We do so much, we've tried to maximize therapeutic outcome. What he was saying is how do you minimize the expense and see what you can get? And so we don't think it's ethical to give a PTSD patient, severe chronic PTSD patient, MDMA without any support. But this is the closest study we're getting. So this is taking place at Yale. Um, Lene, who's here, is gonna be one of the therapists on this study with Woo. Ben Kelmendi. And so it's basically not a therapy study. It's taking PTSD patients, giving them MDMA, and putting them in the scanner and see how they respond to traumatic memories and normal memories. So we have done, healthy volunteers have taken MDMA in scanners. That's how we know about amygdala activation, prefrontal cortex. We've also had PTSD patients in our studies get fMRI before and after, and we can see changes, but there's never been someone with PTSD under MDMA in the scanner at the same time. So that's what this study's gonna do. There's gonna be minimal but some preparation. There's gonna be minimal but some um, integration, and then they're only in the scanner for an hour. So they're gonna do MDMA and it'll last six, seven hours and they'll spend other time with this person uh, communicating with them. It's not formally psychotherapy, but we are using the same measures to see if the PTSD is reduced in this minimal therapy model. Um, next please. And we're also uh, collaborating, as another funder is doing this, 
This is the MDMA for alcoholism, and Ben Sessa just reported the results at a breaking convention conference in London. He's created, he's treated 12 people, 10 of them are either abstinent or are, have way reduced their, their alcohol use. So it's, it's really interesting, but he really needs longer term follow up, but we'll see. But it's initially very promising. Next. Um, okay, so that was the results, and I can end on this. Um, so it took us six, well, it took us 30 years from MAPS starting in 86 to November 29th, 2016, to have the data to present to FDA for what's called an end of phase two meeting to decide whether they'll permit us to go for phase three. So that 30 years took, a, it was a long time, um, but we were able to gather a lot of information and here's the results from those 30 years. So the first thing is that this was 105 people. We did this in Israel, Canada, Switzerland, and the United States. And each of these studies were testing little different things. The purpose of phase two are pilot studies to help you design phase three. So we treat 105 people. As I said earlier, none of these were African Americans, unfortunately, but we did have some Hispanics and others. Uh, next slide, please. And so the big question from a scientific methodological point of view is um, how do you do a double blind study with a psychedelic? So. Um, for those of you that have, have done psychedelics, you, you probably would have a hard time, um, you know, deciding it was actually a placebo. You know, you could tell something is going on. So how do you do this? So a lot of my dissertation was on trying to figure out, you know, at the Kennedy School uh, of Government, so that's where I did my master's and PhD, and I tried to figure out the double blind. And so we were testing all these different drugs, and the idea was that we would use low dose versus high dose, and we needed to pick the low dose that caused enough confusion to be effective double blind, but wasn't so therapeutic that we'd have a hard time telling the difference between the two groups. So we tested all these different doses. Uh, next slide, please. So these were the active, 75 to 125 are the ideal therapeutic doses, plus we give half that amount between one and a half and two and a half hours later to prolong the experience. Um, next slide. So then we had the end of phase two, next slide. And um, here's what we learned. Uh, Zoloft and Paxil, that are the drugs approved for PTSD, work better in women than in men, and they failed completely in combat-related PTSD. So we learned that MDMA-assisted therapy works regardless of the cause of PTSD. That was really, really important. So now once we work to make it into a medicine, if we succeed, it can be for PTSD from any cause. And we can enroll people regardless if it's complex PTSD, single incident of PTSD, war-related PTSD, military sexual trauma, whatever. We also learned that, um, unfortunately, my dissertation was wrong, and that's the beauty of research. You think you got it figured out, and you do a study, and then you realize you weren't uh, as clear as you thought you needed to. So what it turned out is low doses do enhance blinding. I was right about that, but low doses make people more anxious. They don't really have therapeutic. They are anti-therapeutic. So the people who got MDMA without any drug, with an inactive, who got therapy, I mean, without any active MDMA did better than the people that got therapy with low dose MDMA. So you can either choose blinding or you can choose what's, what we presented to FDA. The most important thing is if you can do it with therapy, why bother at a drug? So we're testing therapy with inactive placebo versus therapy with full dose MDMA. We also learned that it's safe and we have medium to large effect size. So next slide, please. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. There's always a Harvard man on the wrong side of every question. This was from the president of Harvard. <laughs> this time was me, sometimes it's Joe. <laughs> um, next one, please. Okay, so the, we did neurocognitive tests. You may have heard about MDMA causing neurocognitive problems with every ecstasy use. We tested that, we did not see that at all in the therapeutic setting, and it's really been way overblown in the recreational setting. Next slide, just a few more to get to the results, go ahead. So this is a really important point we also learned, is when you hear about the work with psilocybin, the work with LSD, both from the 50s and 60s and the current research, what you'll be told is that there's a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcome. Reduced fear of death, reduced depression, reduced uh, drug abuse. And so we use the same measure of mystical experience as is used in the psilocybin LSD work. And so we showed the active doses. People do have rather high scores on the mystical experience questionnaire. Um, point six is a full mystical experience, but the next slide, please. 
there's no correlation. So that's the fundamental difference between MDMA therapy for PTSD and classic psychedelics is that it's not about the mystical experience. It's about reconnecting with your biography, with your intact ego, with the traumatic experience and processing it and working with those memories to do memory reconsolidation to replace. You get better. We find that people's memory for the trauma is increased, but the fear related to it is decreased so that the next time they remember it, they don't have the fear, they have the sense it's, they, it's part of their story and it's in the past. And then here's the results. So 23% of the people in the control group, now these are chronic severe treatment resistant PTSD patients. So 23% no longer had PTSD, which is really, really good for therapy. And so it demonstrates that we're really trying with the therapy. Um, next slide please. So when you add uh, MDMA, um, you, at the two-month follow-up, 61% no longer have PTSD. Yeah. Um, but the, the real question is, does it last? Is this just a psychedelic afterglow? And the beauty of this therapy is that not only does it last, but, next slide, is that it keeps getting better. So two-thirds at the one-year follow-up no longer have PTSD. Um, um, you had a question? Yes, we got to go. Yeah. Uh, but you had one question, then let's go. Yeah, just quickly. So um, I was listening to a talk by the philosopher of Kanye Reader about Lincoln, and he said something really interesting, like, doesn't Kanye raise, like, the point of view of, of extreme self-awareness and everything? He, like, takes the Kanye view with what um, something like psych the purpose of psychotherapy is to make yourself relevant. So rather than, like, getting to know yourself so well to the point where, um, Yeah, I think that, that, that people have said when you get the message, hang up the phone. My view is that it's always a different message. <laughs> and that you can have a lifetime, because you have different challenges at different stages of life. And so I think some people, for what purposes they take it for, they can take it just once and then that's enough for them. But others can make it sort of a lifetime tool. And the best example of that is there was just a study with lifelong Zen meditators into a meditation retreat in Switzerland, a five-day retreat. In the middle, they all got a pill, either psilocybin or placebo. And the meditators, now Zen has been somewhat anti-drug, and what they found is that it helps deepen their meditation practice. So I think you can use these tools for a lifetime. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> I've, 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 been, I've been given the, uh, it's now a Burning Man tradition to have to, to, have to give this guy the hawk. <laughs>